Okay, so here we are. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another EACP Business School webinar. Um, some of you maybe have joined us in previous webinars before, so if you have, welcome once again. So happy to see you with us. Um, for all of you who are new, my name is Krishenka McCarthy, and I will be your moderator today. Um, just small housekeeping, you will see a little red question mark. Um, it almost sounds like it looks like in a bubble. And there's where you will click to make all your questions during the session. Um, the way that we will do it is that we will start with a 30 minute discussion session. And after that, we will dedicate 20 to 25 minutes um, where I will be reading your questions out loud and we will have a discussion about um, your interests. So do, do make notes and start thinking about it throughout um, so that you can take advantage of, of the Q&A. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Cameron, who will be addressing how do people manage disruption. I'm actually very interested in this topic um, and, and talk about the collapse of the market structures and the emergence of new consumption cultures. And having that said, having said that now, um, I leave you to Cameron and I'll see you for the Q&A after 30 minutes. See you soon. Uh, thank you, Korachenka. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. I hope you are all well uh, anywhere you are in the world. Um, so I'm glad that I'm here today with you. I'm going to talk about, you know, how do people manage disruptions. Um, this is mainly as part of the sort of COVID-19, beyond uh, COVID-19 series that we have. This is the, the last webinar of that series. Um, this particular webinar, this is inspired by one of the studies that I've done with my co-authors around uh, disruptions in, in a different context. It was uh, based on the 2008 K2 uh, mountain disaster, you know, mountain climbing disaster. But um, we've realized that a lot of concepts that you know we were uh, seeing in that uh, setting is, is actually observable in the COVID-19 disruption as well. And that's, that's actually what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about some of the concepts that we want to uh, play with and work with them. Um, I'm not going to use theoretical language. I just want to make things quite simple and uh, you know together we, we're gonna look at um, some of the things that we've seen over the past few months and try to uh, provide a new lens or new framework or new viewpoint to to look at them differently so the first part a little bit introduction and then the second part i'm going to talk about uh, how consumers uh, manage disruption and the third part of this um, webinar would be uh, how actually brands now address uh, this uh, disruption. Um, the first um, concept that we are going to use in this um, webinar is consumption practice. Uh, we we engage with a lot of consumption practices. Uh, we consume products and services in the, our day-to-day -day life to manage our uh, life to achieve our life goals and address our needs. When we look at the consumption practice, we can use uh, iceberg analogy to, to look at them. We see some explicit behavior, we see consumers interacting with each other, interacting with brands, and we see that they have certain skills uh, to, to do so, and we see that there are some observable resources, products in, in the photo that you see, um, some, uh, for example, food table, and then they sort of use those to um, address their needs or to uh, go through these consumption practices. However, um, any consumption practice that we engage with, it's built on a foundation, which we normally don't see. Uh, those are the norms and values and assumptions that actually drive those consumption tasks. Uh, for example, in, in this photo, um, these people are dining together, they uh, interact in a certain way, they use knife and force in a certain way, they have certain expectations. For example, if they order something, 
they have an expectation about a certain amount of time that it takes from the uh, restaurant the staff to, to bring their orders. Uh, there are lots of assumptions and norms and values that actually drive every single interaction that we have with uh, products and services. However, uh, we normally don't think about them. Uh, the reason we are not thinking about them is that we actually learn them from early ages. Um, we learn how to eat, how to use uh, products and services, how to cycle, how to shop them, how to cook, how to commute. And one by one, we learn uh, the rules of the game that we call norms or values. And we, we actually develop certain assumptions. We, we assume that if we go to, to a, a superstore, we can find what we need because we learn them and we don't think uh, about them anymore. But these are quite important and these are uh, the, the sort of fundamental aspect of consumption practices that are cultural because it's shared between people. Everybody sort of share the same meaning toward these uh, assumptions. What happens is that um, over time that you know we we uh, practice and we repeat these consumption practices, we routinize them. And the reason we do that is to manage our anxiety. Imagine that you know for every single action that we wanted to uh, take. If we wanted to scratch, uh, for, uh, start from scratch, it would be very difficult. And if we wanted to do two things at the same time, it would be completely impossible. But the way we do it, we routinize consumption tasks. We routinize our interactions with products and services, and we don't even think about them. We follow the way that we always do that, and we don't think about them. At the same time, marketplaces also rely on those assumptions, values, and um, norms that we are following. Uh, they, they actually work on that basis because uh, people think that they assume that if they go to a certain location, they can find what they want to purchase. Or they have an assumption that if they purchase a product, it functions in a, in a certain way. And the companies, they use a qualitative and quantitative data to understand consumers and improve their products and services. At the same time, we're still learning. We learn about new products. We learn about um, radical innovation, disruptive innovation, but it's not as um, big as some, some, something like a you know, huge disruption like COVID-19 that sort of changes the whole marketplace. And, um, and, and it's quite manageable, and that's why market polexes work um, based on those assumptions and values and norms. But here is the question, what happens when we have a disruption? I like this photo as, as an analogy to, to look at disruption. Any, any disruption that, that we have, you can see that there is a similar sort of situation that we can see in this photo. Uh, imagine that this baseball is a threat, is a threat coming towards people. You can see at the bottom of the photo, there are a few people who are quite afraid. They just want to protect themselves. There are some people you know, who are affected by the behavior of other people, uh, like the boy in the middle. Interestingly, you can see that the, some people see it as an opportunity and just want to grab that opportunity. And um, here is, is a positive, it could be a positive um, disruption as well, but even in, in very negative uh, disruptions like COVID-19, also there are groups of uh, people in the marketplace who see that as an opportunity. And then as you can see at the top of the uh, picture, there are a few people who are not affected by uh, this disruption or they don't want to uh, be affected or they don't perceive it as a disruption. So this is exactly what we see in a COVID-19 disruption because it's, it's not a, a disruption or COVID-19 disruption is not a um, moment, it's not an event, it's a process uh, that is subjective. What does that mean? It means that this uh, uh, disruption means different thing for different groups of people and people perceive it differently at different points in time. Some people perceive this 
um, a disruption when uh, they heard the news from China. Some people uh, got affected when they heard a news or a, a news of Italy. Some people were affected when there was actually UK lockdown. I'm talking about you know UK uh, marketplace, and they they were actually um, interested in this disruption at different points in time, and for different people different side of this disruption actually had a meaning. Some people were afraid of uh, the sanitary aspect of it. Some people were afraid of uh, losing the freedom in the lockdown. Some people were afraid of, you know, the consequences of uh, this disruption. So the question that we are going to answer is that, okay, we know that um, uh, we talked about consumption practices, um, we talked about you know norms and assumptions. We talked about um, uh, disruption as as a process. Uh, but how do people uh, react or respond to this this disruption? So from here, I'm trying to first introduce how people respond or manage disruption. How mainly consumers manage disruption and. Uh, at, towards the end of this webinar, we, we're going to review and see how different brands actually responded to uh, this disruption. So imagine that, as, as we said, disruption comes and people perceive it differently. What one thing that happens is that in disruptions, those foundations, those norms and values and assumptions are dismantled. They don't mean anything, and that's why people have to think about completely new consumption practices. And that's why we, we go through several processes. I, I picked uh, five of those uh, processes that are quite relevant for uh, COVID-19 um, disruption, hoarding, learning, creativity, identity work, and recovery. I go through them uh, one by one, but the, there is an overlap between one of them, which is identity work, and some, some of the other ones. Uh, but the reason I wanted to highlight that identity work out of the, the, the processes was that it was particularly important in COVID-19 uh, process, the disruption, sorry. So the first uh, the way or the first process that people go through to manage disruptions is hoarding or stockpiling uh, products or services. And the reason for that is that, as I said, you know, there is the assumptions that people had in, in, in the past that they don't work and people are quite afraid. They start thinking about what's going to happen. There are lots of uncertainties and they just want to protect themselves by uh, preparing for any sort of scenario. It could be, you know, a uh, rational choice of, you know, resources that they want to have, the products that they want to have to fight this, this disruption, or it could be just following the crowd. Um, and then different people with different uh, sort of identity have a different response. I mentioned that it's a subjective process. And some people may want to protect their family, themselves, their neighbors, or society. Some people may sacrifice and not even uh, think about, you know, stockpiling or hoarding. But this is something that normally we see in any uh, disruption, including COVID-19. One thing that uh, really um, is important in disruptions, including uh, COVID-19, is that people actually start learning those new consumption practices, new norms, new assumptions. They have to learn it because they don't work anymore um, because of the disruption. And um, in, in COVID-19 also, uh, this happened and a lot of um, learning was around the, the fact that, you know, people had to uh, solve their problems uh, within home uh, or they had to actually uh, perform social distancing. And you could see that, you know, there were lots of uh, learning happening around how I'm going to do uh, exercise at home, how I'm going to do cooking at home and this is an example uh, the graph uh, is an example of you know uk google search for a recipe you know a lot of people are just wanted to learn around the, the lockdown uh, period how they, they're going to cook uh, meals and 
you can see that uh, you can repeat this search and see that there are lots of learning in the marketplace for, for people just to, to know how to engage with new consumption tasks. Remember that this is not as bad as our childhood because we already have a lot of knowledge and skills that we can borrow in, in disruptions. But still, you can see that comparably, uh, there is a huge amount of learning in the marketplace. Uh, the third uh, process is creativity and improvisation. Uh, the issue in disruption is that um, we are limited with choices. We are limited uh, sometimes with, with the products. There is a shortage of egg, shortage of sanitary material, shortage of uh, toilet paper, shortage of you know uh, pasta, and so on and so forth. Shortage of even products that we, we need to, to actually um, use to perform new consumption practices. And that's why what we see in disruptions is a lot of creativity from consumer side. A lot of learning, a lot of creativity. And uh, people actually try to solve their problems with limited amount of resources that they have. I like um, the Captain Tom's example of, you know, uh, trying to solve his problem of helping NHS by uh, using his uh, 100th birthday walk as a means um, to, to sort of uh, address that problem. And actually people um, responded very well to this by, uh, you know, appreciating that he recognized the resources, the limited resources, but valuable resources that he had to to sort of um, meet the end goal. And people supported this campaign. And I, I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of you know that actually he raised over 30 million pounds for uh, NHS National Health System in, in the UK. The fourth process that I want to talk about is identity work. And identity work is around uh, understanding who we are and expressing that to, to other people. Um, the, the reason I just wanted to highlight this is that um, in, in a lot of disruptions, there is an opportunity for uh, people to express themselves. Normally communities come together after disruptions, families come together, However, uh, COVID-19, unfortunately, was actually isolating people. So uh, removing a lot of opportunity for social interaction. It was more about social distancing. And uh, thanks to digital technologies, we could still survive in enabling a lot of social interaction. But still, it was quite challenging. And it was very interesting to see how people and consumers use products and services to express, to understand themselves and express themselves. The first uh, process, the very first group of ways that people uh, express their identity and understand it is by controlling new products and services. Uh, you can uh, see that you've seen that, you know, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all social media, people were showing that how they were able to actually cope with the situation by controlling new uh, platforms and you know enabling some of uh, the, the consumption paths that they have. Uh, we talked about creativity uh, not only to resolve our functional problems but also to um, express our identity whether by you know crafting um, new new products and services like face coverings in a way to show our identity or by again using limited resources that we have limited space um, redecorating our home to uh, again express our identity and finally by participating in uh, band communities for example by participating in clapping for NHS um you know uh, by participating in certain you know brand um advertisement and so on and so forth something that is very important is that in disruptions we think that uh we have less freedom we have less power because we are losing a lot of choices um but uh the interesting point here is that 
uh, disruption actually gives consumers a lot of power. And the reason for that is that it dismantles those norms and those institutions and those assumptions. So actually consumers, if they want and if, if they can find ways, they can actually do whatever they like, or at least they can actually reform, reformulate and reconfigure those consumption practices that better reflect their identity. So in a way, uh, it gives us a lot of power as well. We can discuss it in the Q&A that, you know, um, we think that on the one hand that we're losing power, but on the other hand, it gives us a lot of power to go against uh, something that we couldn't do uh, before the disruption. And finally, uh, the recovery process. Um, this is a theory that I just wanted to show you to is that, you know, um, we are normally at the ontological state of security. We are happy when disruption happens. We move towards the state of insecurity. And as soon as situations get fixed, we want to go back to the original state of security because you know, we are not happy. We got used to the original ways of living. We got used to those norms and assumptions and values. And the good news is that as soon as the, the disruption is over, we want to go back to, to normal. However, the only difference is that it's not gonna be exactly the same state that we had before disruption, because as I mentioned, people uh, have learned a lot of new things, people have um, created a lot of things, people actually had a chance to look at their identity and revise the way uh, they, they were interacting with product and services. So definitely um, the post the sort of disruption situation won't be similar to, to the situation that we had uh, in the past. So, so far, I try to sort of summarize very fast. Sorry, you know, we, we only have 30 minutes uh, sort of time. Summarize five different categories of processes through which consumers manage disruption. So from now, what I'm gonna do is to look at how hands actually respond to these changes, to these disruptions. Um, I'm sure that, you know, we've seen um, thousands of examples of different ways you know, brands are responding to this crisis. Uh, but what I wanted to, to uh, do is to try to summarize that based on the conversation that we had around consumption practices and those the cultural elements, particularly norms, assumptions, and, and values. And I created this two by two uh, graph. Uh, you know, we like these two by twos at business school to make the world a little bit simpler to, to understand and give us an analytical framework. And as you can see, um, the first axis shows whether the brands are trying to uh, support or enable existing consumption practice, or they are creating or supporting new consumption. Either they are transforming into new products and services to enable these existing original consumption practices or transforming to create new consumption practices. Or there are brands that they were lucky, you know, their existing products and services were relevant to this disruption and they are leveraging on those to enable existing practices or create um, new consumption practices. So what I'm going to do is to just give you some example of um, different ways that, you know, these four different ways that brands try to um, address uh, COVID-19 uh, disruption. The first category where brands that, you know, were active in, in our day-to-day -day life, but they become quite relevant by, um, finding themselves in a situation that they can actually enable a lot of original practices that a lot of consumers cannot um, perform anymore. And uh, because of the nature of crisis, they were mainly those solutions that actually enable to, to perform practices at home 
um, you know, interacting with people digitally, you know, purchasing digitally, in turn, training yourself digitally. And um, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you've been using these uh, platforms over the past few months. So these are, you know, the, the brands that at the beginning they struggled because they couldn't cope with the demand, but, you know, gradually they improved. They actually, some of them, they innovated as well to, to support properly the way people actually were using these brands to address um, their problems. But the goal of these brands were to try to sort of enable those existing practices, you know, uh, but in a, in a new context. The second categories were um, those brands that they had to actually transform. They had to create new products and services or adapt their products and services in a way to um, enable those existing practices. I have ESCP, one photo from ESCP in the top uh, left hand side um, showing our students engaging in a project that we had with our partner L'Oreal uh, with our students from MSc in Marketing and Creativity and MSc in Digital Transformation and they've done a great job um, to, to work on a project for a week um, and, and actually uh, for a week and they actually did it in, in a new situation. It was sort of transformed from a, a face to face being in the same location co-located project to a, a project that's been done all over the world we had students uh, in china india us europe um, uh, maybe north africa and, and middle east uh, who were working together to to actually perform that another example is uh, the Example I'm showing you on the top right hand side of the, the, the slide, Cot Brazier, which is a uh, UK based uh, restaurant chain, you know, French style restaurant chain. And what they did was they came up with this idea of cut to your door, you know, just providing this ingre prepared ingredients of the same dishes that they were offering uh, to people uh, to sort of uh, try to, uh, you know, simulate or um, replicate the similar experience that people had before disruption. And remember the aim of these brands uh, in enabling existing practices were to um, do as much as they can to be close to the existing practices. However, we know that, you know, um, depending on which consumption task we, we are talking about, they, they couldn't actually exactly replicate those. Some of them were a little bit more successful i have an example of elementts outdoor studio which is in toronto and enable people to have actually outdoor yoga still featuring social distancing which was uh, a, which is a great um, innovation and transformation but uh, they had the infrastructure for it but there, there were some brands on the other side as well that they were quite limited in in being able to replicate um existing uh consumption practices i have this example of skoda i hope you've watched the, their uh, ad after the the sort of uh, this webinar as well what they did was um they had this advertisement shot at home completely using uh, car toys and although they could not replicate you know traveling or you know driving experience for people but they were just you know trying to help people to imagine those experiences so you can see that there were wide range of transformation either as um, you know um, simple as a, a marketing campaign or as a creative and disruptive as you know completely changing uh, product and service uh, uh, value proposition that um, brands have. And uh, the third categories of um, brands uh, or products and services that um, actually helped people in the crisis were those uh, that were existed, probably were used in different contexts, but they become relevant because people adopted new consumption practices. I have two examples here. People adopted, you know, using a lot of sanitary material in, in their day-to-day -day, uh, life. So sanitary material become quite relevant. So they re leverage on, 
on their existing product to create these new practices. Or um, uh, some shops and restaurants started, you know, controlling and measuring temperature of their customers. And, you know, um, uh, temperature control devices become quite relevant in those settings. The final group of uh, brands responding to uh, this crisis were those brands where that actually created new products and designed new products that um, supported uh, the creation of new practices, whether they were uh, around you know uh, creating new face coverings or um, partitioning um, elements or uh, hygiene books that help people to um, avoid, you know, uh, hygiene risks or to, to be able to um, keep the, the social distancing while interacting with other uh, consumers and other people. So these four categories, actually, it's, it's a good way to uh, evaluate if you are a brand to see how actually, what are the different opportunities? How are, are you going to be able to help people in uh, this disruption? Are you able to leverage on your product? Or are you, do you need to transform? Are you supporting or are you trying to uh, replicate and, and enable existing practices? Or are you going to uh, create completely new practices that actually facilitate uh, people and, and help people? Um, then there is a question of there, we've seen that there were lots of brands that, you know, they've been uh, silent in this disruption and they um, they didn't take risks or they didn't innovate or they didn't react to it. We can discuss it in the Q&A whether uh, it, it was a good strategy, bad strategy, but I just wanted to for now map different ways that brands responded. And I just wanted to look at how people engage with a number of uh, product and service interactions in response to, to the situation that they are in, in COVID-19 disruption. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know it was fast, but I'm happy to discuss uh, some of the issues that I explained uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was super interesting. Um, I, I even have some questions, um, but we do have some questions for the audience. So first of all, thank you for sticking around and, and taking part to this interesting uh, topic. I think that there's a lot that we can say about it. And I will start straight away with the first question, just because I wanna make sure that we do get all our questions out. So uh, the first question we had was, will you say that COVID was a one-off disruption or is it more a continuous one? And if so, does that mean that brands need to continuously conduct research and revise their offer or make it as flexible as, po as possible? Very good question. Amazing question. Um, so uh, the way a lot of people see COVID-19 is a temporary disruption. So because we, we believe that one year down the road, two years down the road, we're going to, you know, have vaccine and then we, we're going to go back to the uh, new secure state. And that's probably why some brands, they don't even want to react because it's also a, a risky venture to, to sort of respond in this very uncertain situation. But we we may, uh, I mean, there has been, you know, a lot of, you know, disruptions that were more permanent and uh, and that's that were uh, the case, for example, normally after war, there are lots of, you know, uh, more permanent consequences for people. And that's where, you know, a lot of brands actually invest more permanently to respond to it. But uh, the way I see this disruption is that at least from the brand's uh, point of view, you don't see that, you know, a lot of people are heavily, a lot of brands are heavily investing because there is this, you know, assumption that, you know, one year down the road or the maximum two years down the road, we, we can, you know, um, uh, fight back and, you know, uh, remove this disruption and hopefully. But, you know, it's it's very interesting that you say that because I think that this is a type of disruption that can affect cultural behavior. So 
you know, if you think about the more microscopic level, when you're thinking about coughing, right? That you're saying, oh, don't use your hands, you should use your elbow, um, or elements like when you're going to open something, wash your hands or clean yourself. And you can already see that people are changing the, the way that they're thinking. So even if this wasn't continuous, I can see how some behaviors will already be impacted in a way that then it will be the future. So now the expectations will be different socially, right? Absolutely. I think that that's where we, I mentioned that it's going to be a, a, a new sort of a, a state of security, which is a little bit different from uh, the, the past, because as you said, it's, it's actually a good opportunity for a lot of people to question things that they were doing without knowing why they were doing. But what happens is that we go back to a lot of cultural elements that we like and we still can associate meaning to. Um, but we may start questioning some of them. I mean, um, for example, I mean, a lot of people um, were hesitating to engage with, you know, digital uh, technologies, uh, but now they have to. So it may actually break that barrier, that you know, resistance that they've always had with digital technology, and it may show to them that you know it's not actually that bad. It actually, in this uh, disruption, helps a lot of us to perform a lot of consumption practices. So we may not have that resistance anymore that we had uh, before uh, COVID-19 disruption. So we we may see that there would be a lot more and more um, digital transformation in the next few years. But again, uh, it, it really depends on whether we still can associate meaning to some of those norms and values or not. And then absolutely right. Some of them, we may actually continue to, to, to do them in the, in the new way. Yes, definitely. I think I'm going to ask this this next question because maybe it, it, it it's it's parallel to what we're saying. So um, this question says, um, I can see some parallels of the topic with product adaptation life cycle. So uh, the diffusion of innovation. Disruption made us all adapt technologies at a much faster pace than some people would have wanted. Is there a way to smooth in the transition of processes following a major disruptive event? Um, it's, it's an interesting, in a way, when you have a radical product coming into a market, it's, it's actually one sort of disruption because it's questioning the, the sort of old uh, norms and values and assumptions. Um, I, I'm sure that a lot of uh, people have read Christiansen's you know, idea of disruptive innovation. Actually, the name is disruptive innovation. It's a completely new product that is completely changing the way marketplace work. And I'm glad that um, the person mentioned life cycle. But what happens is that when you people have opportunity, because I mentioned that a disruption is a process, mm -hmm. is a subjective process, some people at the beginning may see a disruptive technology or a disruptive product as an opportunity and adopt to it. But still, you have a lot of people as laggards or, you know, who, who are spectacle and, and they, they just want to protect themselves against these new uh, products. So we, we're going to have the same uh, cycle. Uh, in this disruption, the, the, the main difference that this disruption has is that it actually forced a lot of people. So the people didn't have a choice. They had to stay in lockdown or they had to sort of distant themselves from other people. So they had to actually rethink about, you know, adopting these new products. But normally in the, in the free market, at least, we don't have that in place. And normally that's why it sort of shows itself into a, a life cycle model. Okay, that, yes, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'm going to try and move along a little bit and change the topic into, can you give us an example of a consumer controlling new products and services? Yeah. Um, if, for example, you know, um, one of the good examples of controlling products and services is when you learn a new musical instrument when you can actually control that. And, and, and you can actually, you understand yourself better. You 
start believing that that instrument is part of you as well. Uh, so for some people who, who are into music, because a lot of, you know, um, the processes through which we control products or services are uh, from when, when we are quite um, in, in early ages of our lives, what we may not remember. But uh, remember the things that you could actually do and learn to do when you were adult. And as soon as you learn them, you, you actually unconsciously start being someone else. You know, when, I mean, the, the, the clear example is that, for example, when you learn to play guitar, you know, just, you know, being able to control, being able to play the guitar becomes part of your identity. That's very interesting. But I wonder if that's also the case, um, depending on age, because I could also see it that for laggers or people that are older and when it comes to technology they never really thought that they really needed it right besides work working or or managing a team but now all of a sudden it became oh i need to learn this to be able to communicate with my family to be able to connect with other people so it's now having to get control of technology as an individual so as part of your personality right um I can see that as, as a way of controlling a service or product. A very good point. I think something, this is, we need to investigate it, but definitely controlling something which is more difficult, it means more to you. So if you control a product or service easily, you may not, you know, create that, you know, bond or attachment to it as when it's very difficult and and the examples that you mentioned is, is the situation that some people actually um invested a lot of effort and time to to learn something which is uh, quite difficult for them for example you know people who didn't uh, who were not used to interact with digital technologies uh, you know some of us were lucky that you know we we grew up in a, in a in an environment that for us it's you know just working with computers and laptops and smartphones is easy, but for some people is difficult and controlling those definitely means more and it becomes more part of their identity. And sometimes, I mean, I'm remembering uh, one of my aunts that actually, uh, it become actually part of her, her personality being a digital lady, you know, at, at, at the age of, you know, 70, 80. So I, I think that that's something that, that we see absolutely a, a good point, but I mean, uh, I, I don't remember a, a research or scientific study that you know proves that. But that's absolutely mm -hmm. the way I look at it. I'm um, actually the comment came from a question that I'm going to read now because uh, the question is, uh, what are the ways for a consumer electronic brand to respond in this COVID situation? Um, and so it, it's sort of like now you have a bigger target audience because before you will say the young and hip early bird people were the ones that you will travel first, but now that's not the case, right? Now you need to make technology accessible, truly accessible for everybody. I think that's one of those things that creates a lot of opportunity for brands. Uh, I think very good observation. Uh, in, in this question that actually um, after this disruption, I mean, back going back to the sort of uh, this discussion of some of the things stay as permanent and some things are uh, temporal is that we you have new segments of the markets with new skills and new knowledge and with new appetite and you need to uh, address them. And definitely, I think uh, the first, you know, study of marketing is that to, to sort of, if you can recognize those segments, um, if you want to capture them, and if you see that, you know, um, there is enough space to, to enter that, you need to rethink about you, your products. I think that's the first lesson because you're not talking to the same people, although they may have the appetite, although they may be able to engage, they may be willing to engage with these technologies, uh, they still are different. So they may have different needs in terms of, for example, user experience design. You may actually completely rethink uh, the design of your wearable you know, uh, technologies or uh, other digital or consumer electronics uh, technologies as, uh, that, that you have. So 
you need to start from understanding these new emerging uh, market mm -hmm. segments. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, we continue with the consumer norms. So this is something that we touched upon a little bit earlier. Um, after what time, time span, so the lifetime uh, of, of a person, does the consumer norm or value really permanently change? And will this information help companies in planning? Yeah, I think it's it's a very difficult question. And, question, I, uh, I, yeah, I know. I mean, cultural norms. I, I remember, you know, uh, Edgar Schein, who, who who is actually organizational culture guru. He had this idea of you can actually change culture in 15 years, but it really depends. Um, look at you know uh, some of the consumer cultures that disappeared over the past five years you know you can see that there are some things that are more temporal uh, and you can see that there are lots of you know cultural elements that are more permanent they've been there for thousands of years you know people celebrating and engaging with some rituals which makes it quite difficult if you want to change it but there are some you know cultural norms that are a little bit more uh, temporary because you know they just are created by the uh, entrance of uh, a new product in the market and if there is a, another better product in the market in in the matter of few years you can actually change the whole uh, culture so i mean definitely we are talking about years but it really depends on the cultural norms some of them are very difficult i mean uh, may not even see that you can change some cultures that have roots of meanings to people and it touches their values but some of them that are quite functional is just the way that you know you interact with product and services as soon as you know there is something better easier um, uh, you, you probably you can easily uh, enter into this, those newer spaces by changing those norms yeah, and, and I think that this will be relevant um, again to, to this next question. Thank you so much. These are really interesting questions, actually. Um, first of all, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. So I want to convey that. Um, the question is regarding the luxury industry. So um, the person just recently read an article yesterday that mentioned that while luxury industry witnesses a reduction of sales, um, even closing of some, of some shops, the sale of luxury products in China actually greatly increased. How can we understand such cross-cultural differences in consumptions in face of a pandemic and new consumer practices? Um, let's put aside the, the China's issue because that's completely different. Um, but what happened was that, you know, I mean, I mentioned the identity war and a lot of luxury products are uh, those products that people are engaged with to, to understand themselves better and to express themselves better or to appreciate themselves. And um, I mean, obviously I think given the situation, given the isolating nature of the situation, um, that was sort of, you know, quite obvious that, you know, culture, you know, identity related products would suffer a lot, you know, in general fashion and uh, even non luxury fashion products, which are identity related products, suffered a lot. Um, in China, it probably is different because uh, the China was not affected as much as, you know, European country from this disruption. You know, if you look at, you know, 1.5 billion uh, uh, population of China, just few cities with millions of population affected. So, uh, and if you look at the sort of um, the trend line, China was already booming towards, you know, purchase of luxury uh, products. So it's the sort of nature of that economy. I don't think it's cultural. It's completely cultural the way um, you know, uh, Chinese people, different segments that are there in interacting with, you know, uh, luxury products. But uh, in terms of when we talk about, you know, um, Chinese is still booming or growing in, in luxury sector, and we see that in Europe at least, or in the UK, there is a decline, is, is because, you know, this disruption affected these two marketplaces differently. 
but yeah, I think one thing is that um, uh, I think it would be temporary this uh, crisis, even for luxury brands, because we are hoping that you know everything goes back to to normal. But I think a lot of people also revisiting the way they look at luxury products as well. It will it will definitely be the new normal. I will yes. say the new normal. Um, I'm going to move away a little bit and talk about strategy and businesses. So we have a question here about what are the strategies that startups and SMEs should follow in case of a disruption? Are they the same as a big company? Um, um, actually, no. <laughs> It's actually uh, depends on the on their product or services, but they are in a better position than big companies. I mean, you you can see uh, when you look at you know um, new solutions, new uh, products and services addressing crisis related or disruption related uh, consumption practices. A lot of SMEs, a lot of small companies are actually responding much faster than large, large companies because for large companies it's much more difficult. They don't have that flexibility to, to respond to this, particularly for temporal or temporary disruption. They don't have that you know, um, uh, agility to be able to respond. So actually it's an opportunity for uh, small and medium companies to, to be able to grab this as an opportunity to uh, help people and put uh their mark or their signature in in the, in the marketplace but again it really depends on the on the category for example if you're competing against amazon i mean amazon is already booming in this situation so probably for smes it's still the same you know very competitive environment that they had in, in the past but for those um uh, marketplaces where there is a need for transformation for new product and new services in a fast pace i think that's where uh smes could actually perform very well i think that one and this will incorporate the following question i think one of the um fears is how do i create impact how do i differentiate myself um with my current customer base because the current customer base um, they will now officially have different needs and they will have different priorities, but you still want to mark up any product that you have to those customers. You don't want to be spending money gaining new customers um, and, and just getting rid of that asset. So I guess the question is more based on, you know, what can you do um, as a small company to create impact? Yeah, I think um, just, uh, you know, even keeping your existing customers satisfied is already an impact in this this uh, disruption because we've seen that, you know, a lot of brands, they, they were struggling even keeping their customers satisfied. I think that to me, I mean, we, here in higher education, we had the same situation and our first priority was to keep our students still satisfied and, you know, um, although it, the, the, the sort of disruption affected us um, significantly, but still that was the, the main aim. Um, so uh, again, it, it really depends on um, the, the product and service that these SMEs are offering in the market. Some of them might be actually, I, I showed you, you know, some of the products like the, for example, the hygiene hook, which is a very a creative, um, uh, product uh, developed by a very small, you know, company, uh, entrepreneurial company, just designed this, you know, just finding this opportunity, grab that as as a as a new way to, um, as as you know, our our friend uh, is mentioning, as a new way to uh, acquire new customers by launching this product. So uh, a lot of still opportunity to be fast. Um, to grasp new customers. But I think I would say that still is the some sort of moral obligation for brands to take care of their existing customer in this hostile, you know, dis disruptive environment. And then next think about, you know, uh, acquiring new, new customers and finding new opportunities. So customer service all the way and then thinking of new things.
Um, and now I think I'm going to give you a difficult question because I've been trying to think about this one. So um, will you have an example of a brand that has engaged in more than one strategy response? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, leverage to create new practices while also catering to the old practices. Um, and it's follow, following up, it's, is it advisable to engage in multiple strategies or responses? And if so, when? Uh, I mean, I can say that, you know, at different points, a lot of these, these brands, uh, they definitely, uh, those who actually transformed to uh, enable um, existing practices, they had to actually also uh, adopted the strategy of, you know, um, transforming to enable new practices. Because, for example, in the restaurants, there is a completely new uh, ways of um, new new normal, the new ways of dining. So they had to actually reconfigure the restaurant to enable new practices. Or in the higher education sector, it's criminal. Uh, so as we move away from lockdown and into, into uh, sort of um, ease down of lockdown a lot of brands started you know from uh particularly i'm talking about you know uh, our own brand escp or a lot of higher education institutions a lot of you know service institution moving away from uh, leveraging uh, transforming to enable existing um, uh, consumption practices enable education enable dining to a situation where they have to actually also, uh, in a way, to, to sort of create new practices, how people actually interact with each other, how are we gonna make sure that they are safe, how we are gonna make sure that you know, uh, they can do those practices, but with, new, with the implementation of these new consumption tasks. And that's very interesting because following up, um, the other question was a lot of schools are doing this. They're moving to online education um, and, and offering more choices for people to study. And so the question is, do you think that this is beneficial for the long run to give studies um, which still you, you will have to learn in a brick and mortar education, but you, you will have to do it online. So would this be a benefit or not? Um, so th th there are different view viewpoints on it, uh, but the first thing to to sort of um, bear in mind is that, in particular for these contexts that we are talking about, is that there has been a disruption. So the easier way is to say, okay, let's stop, let's not move on, and that, so there is a choice stop not do anything wait until we think that this is a temporary event it comes back you know everything is is normal and then we continue but at the same time there has been you know people who actually need this it's they are investing their time they, they, it's it's their actually valuable time uh, in their life uh, and and actually having brands to to enable them to continue I think that's valuable. It's 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 a debate. Some people may say that no, I mean it, it should be perfect, and then uh, you know um, then you have to continue. But sometimes you lose a little bit of you know um, uh, edge of um, you know your your service delivery. But there is a condition here. It doesn't mean that you need to do you you have to you can you, or you are allowed to do any sloppy job you have to i think the first rule i mentioned was to be able to offer something which is as close as uh, the original existing consumption practices so that's the aim it doesn't mean that you have you, you are changing those practices although there might be a slight changes because of um, because of the, the, the sort of new situation, you have to uh, aim for uh, replicating and simulating the exact same sort of consumption practices uh, by using different technologies, by innovating, by fighting the situation. And in, in settings like, you know, higher education or um, service sector in, in particular, it's a co-creation environment. 
it's not only the brands who are responsible for reaching that sort of um, maximum level of value creation. It's also the consumers as well that have the, those moral responsibility to go ahead and you know uh, make it happen. And and we've had a, a lot of good good examples. I mean, I'm, I can talk about my own students who were amazing at the beginning, very skeptical, but they actually decided to fight the situation and co-created a lot of positive things. Not only. Um, uh, I mean, no, we are moving to this idea of co consumers co-creating. Um, and if you think that the students are consumers, they were not only uh, trying to sort of help um, the, the university to, to sort of deliver and co-create the best uh, processes that they can, but also they actually innovated and created new activities by you know, helping each other, helping other students, uh, creating events to entertain each other and also professors and uh, there's some sort of uh, even you know helping next year students um, engaging with you know practitioners they actually use this as an opportunity to be able to at least aiming towards uh, a situation that we were expecting to have uh, which was um, before uh, COVID-19, but that that's the sort of way to do it. So it really depends how you do it, but the aim should be we do something which is as close or in in some aspects even better than the original uh, the original consumption practice. Thank you so much. Um, we are almost at the end, and before we go, I wanted to ask you if you can give us in a sentence what we should take away of disruptions and market disruptions what because i see in the audience we have a lot of entrepreneurs we have a lot of people interested in in building companies and products who already have companies and products and they're you know i'm, I'm guessing there's this fear of of disruptions and following next year and the year after so what will be your insights in a sentence yeah, I think one thing that I personally believe and I, when I presented so sort of that informed my way of thinking is uh, actually care uh, and act, uh, which is quite valuable because I see that a lot of brands, a lot of marketers, they're quite afraid that, you know, they're losing, you know, brand image or they're, it's a risky venture to, you know, interfere with this disruption. For me, it's actually much more than that. It's it's just being responsible to the society, being responsible to your consumers, uh, and also from the consumer side, being responsible to society. We've, we've seen, you know, the new examples that actually consumptions become responsible. You know, help out to eat out. Sorry, eat out to help out, for example. Um, so, being responsible, care about, you know. Uh, others in the society in the marketplace and also act be creative and act to to respond to problems that would be my uh, main or one sentence that you asked perfect me. and 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 co-create right collaborate co yeah, yeah. Co -create, <laughs> um this was amazing actually i i have to say thank you to our audience the questions were great um thank you professor cameron for today's um presentation you have been amazing i've learned so much and i hope that everybody that joined us today also had um a lot of questions i know that i didn't get to all of them i do apologize it always happens uh, when we're trying to keep to an hour um you can definitely contact us and reach us if you really have a burning question that Professor Cameron can probably um, respond via email. Thank you again for spending time with us. This is actually the conclusion of our ESCP Business School webinar series. Um, it has been an amazing ride. <clears throat> And I only say it on behalf of the London campus, but I'm pretty sure that all the other campuses will also say the same. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we hope that you keep in touch and see what's coming up next. Have a great afternoon. For those that are experiencing the heat wave, stay hydrated and hopefully see you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. It was great to, to meet you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.